want to speak in is the Reformation as the work of the Spirit. Now, allow me to begin with a few preparatory remarks. There are several ways to discuss, approach rather, a discussion about the topic of Reformation. And whenever I say Reformation, I mean capital R. Speaking as a historian, one is likely to deal with it as um, the Reformation, capital T and capital R. Likewise, if one is a cultural anthropologist or cultural critic, this uh, framing will seem apt. It is my sense, though, that when a theologian approaches the matter, it is best done in light of the work of these scholars, but it must be different in intent. I suggest this because of my increasingly urgent sense that for a theologian to write, teach, or publicly address matters of gravity as a historian, cultural critic, or social anthropologist is to invite others to what I describe as the bondage of memory. Memory most often shaped by those exercising hegemony today. I believe this to be the case because of the habit of theologians to speak authoritatively and normatively of the things of faith and life. So we speak as if what we say really matters. Even in those instances in which disruption is our goal, it is my sense that when we are in a time such as ours, in which there is a desperate need for new religious and civic imagination, it is the responsibility of theologians to be about the work of contributing to new imaginations and not simply trying to tell you how we got here. This is even more so the case when opportunity is given to speak in spaces other than one's own mind. These remarks are to situate this lecture, so it's not going to be a lecture on theological method, but rather to situate this lecture squarely in the vein of constructive theology and to explain why it will be neither a pay-on to or theological reflection on the Reformation, but rather an exploration of the idea of Reformation. Instead, I will take what I understand to be the spirit of the Reformation as the unction for my remarks today. Now, the notion of Reformation as a theologically significant concept is necessarily as an ecclesiological discourse. That is to say, it is concerned with the nature, being, and presence of the church in the world. I would further suggest that its field of meaning is best understood as having to do with the work of the Spirit, specifically the Spirit's work in the places and moments in which the church in its existence too closely resembles the world of which it is a part. Now I want to note here that the church will always necessarily resemble the world because it is made of the things of the world, right? People, even though we forget it sometimes, we are things of the world. But there are times, and what I have in mind is when the church too closely reflects the lethal dimensions of the fallenness of the world and not the power of God in the face of them. I would then suggest that the notion of reformation is a necessary and constituent of any helpful ecclesiology. Helpful, that is, to those chafing and perishing under the systems of wickedness generated by powers which use the structures of fallenness to exert hegemony. This lecture will be an attempt to sketch a basis for an ecclesiology which can sustain the notion of reformation as a part of the DNA of the church and not treat it as an episodic disruption of the church's life. So I now turn to that work. There are any number of ways um, to offer a description of what is meant by the church, capital C. I always begin to itch a little bit when I say that because I'm an old New England congregationalist and when I, you know, we, we like small c in, in terms of churches, but here I'm going to be talking about the church, big c. 
Traditionally, these descriptions have fallen under the rubrics of act and being. Each of these points to a way of describing the church by either our actions in the world or by its physical presence through history in a trans-historical manner, which rendered it as something other than simply a creature of history. So the very presence of the church through history means it's not a prisoner of history. Often these have been offered as alternative ways of speaking about the church with a form of focus on some implicit understanding that the church is present when some certain way of being materially present to the world um, is how we know the church, while the other holds the idea that the church is always a present reality made visible through our institutional life, which gives witness to the continuing presence of the spirit, yet it is never reducible to that life. So the idea of the church as act is the idea that when the church is doing some specific things in the world, that is the church made visible. The other in terms of being is that the church's reality, while it is inclusive of the material um, presentation of the church, it is not wholly consumed by that. While I have perhaps painted the difference a bit too starkly, I think it is well to note that the two poles of ecclesiological discourse, which um, I have identified here, particularly in the Western church, um, lead us to often forget that there is an implicit tension between these ways of talking about the church, which usually expresses itself in our context in debates about liberals wanting the church to do nothing more than be a social action agency, and orthodox wanting to alternatively being too focused on the purity of the church and its members, thus focusing on public and ecclesial piety. So one believes that the church can't be the church unless it changes the world, and the other believes that the church is precisely the church when it understands itself apart from the world. Certainly, there is enough to be said about this differing vision to fill a library. In fact, it quite literally has filled a library since the conversation began with Paul and James. So this is a very old conversation. I would like to invite you to a slightly different terrain to explore this question of how we might fitfully describe the church in our time and give, use an idiom to create a new ecclesiological basis to do that. Here I offer what is going to be the thought innovation around which this lecture is built. That is, I want to suggest that whatever the church may be right now, it is an afterthought of the spirit. That is to say, I want to explore the idea that the church is ever becoming through its materialization into the spaces which have been created by the working of the spirit, but that the spirit has now gone on to do whatever else it is that God is doing in the world. Well, I want to invite you into um, uh, a discursive world that's informed by relational theology, I ask that you check your white Hedian metaphysics at the door. So this is not a lecture or a proposition grounded in process theology, simply informed by relational theology. Now, in its place, I would rather you might try on what I think about as the beret of unknowing. Y'all know I'm a big fan of berets, and I think they cut quite a good image. So if we're going to be ignorant of things, we might as well look good doing it, right? <laughs> so what I'm asking in, ra in a rather fanciful way is that for a bit we embrace the great mystery of God in such a way that affirms its effective presence in the world without immediately seeking to either make that presence synonymous or materialized exclusively in the doings of the church. So God is doing a whole lot more in the world than the church. 
Now, in place of this, customary, this custom of relating God's work in the world to the church, I would like for a moment to invite another way of thinking. That way is to think of God's spirit quickening the forces within creation which nourish, sustain, and proliferate material, psychic, and spiritual flourishing as being God's beckoning to the church as it continues to unfold the life of Christ in the world. So that the spirit's activity in the world is actually God calling to the church and not working necessarily exclusively within the church. I would suggest that the notion of reformation is best understood as attentiveness and response to this beckoning. Now, before setting off into these largely uncharted waters of theological exploration, let me tell you the price of the ticket. The fair is your willingness to entertain the idea that the church, in any of our material forms, bears witness to the work of the Spirit already completed. And therefore, we err when we seek the Spirit's work within our ecclesial spaces. This is not to say these spaces are unimportant. They are vitally important precisely because they bear witness to a power beyond themselves, which I would argue needs to be distinguished from the home of a resident ghost. I term it a fair because I'm asking of you something that is not without cost. Cost in your time here today and perhaps cost in making room in what I know are already full imaginations for thinking about that to which we have all dedicated our lives, the church, and our place in it as parts of the Missio Dei proleptically. So that means that we root our entire identity in what the church is, in what the spirit is doing and not what the spirit has done. And only secondarily then, in terms of contemporary substance. Now, a way to think about the church um, that will, will allow this kind of turn in our way of approaching ecclesiology is with the idea of figuration, which in its simplest rendering is the shaping of some reality such that it becomes recognizable in its context. This simple definition is helpful because it calls to mind two dimensions of the church's reality, which we sometimes forget. First, it has never been the claim that the church is the instantiation of the Spirit of God. That has never been the claim. Often, the historic claim that the church is the vessel of salvation has been mistaken for a claim of instantiation instead of its intended meaning, which is that of via gratia, a means of grace, or a way of grace. This misunderstanding has often led those with a high ecclesiology and low to presume that somehow it is sensible to talk about the church as synonymous with the spirit. So when we talk about the church, we automatically think we're talking about what the spirit is doing in the world, whether speaking for or against the proposition. So high ecclesiology would speak for it, low ecclesiology would speak against it, but both are making the same error. So the idea of figuration clarifies that the church makes something visible and recognizable in the world in a way of reference and not necessarily representation. That something is, I would argue, the spirit. The idea of figuration also reminds us of the importance of context in this whole conversation. The particularity of matrices of communal experience, systems of meaning, cosmologies, and epistemologies all shape how a particular figure will be received as a vehicle of mediation for some reality apart from itself. This is not to say that the figure is a creature of context. It is always much more than that. It is to say, however, that apart from context, a figure is quite literally senseless. A quick example, the figure of the Good Shepherd. Even with its centrality to Christian iconography and popular 
uh, Christology, each new generation of Christians must be given intense education about the life and tasks of a shepherd for this figure to make sense. Because so few of us have any contact whatsoever with the sort of agrarian life in which a shepherd is still a full-time um, job. This, even more so, as persons in communities are generationally removed from any sort of husbandry beyond that of caring for the family pet. A figure then draws on the noetic conjuring of reality by an audience as the stuff of which it makes its meaning. Now with this in mind, we might then more clearly understand the idea of the church as the figuration of the spirit. With this idea, the church is understood to be the way that the spirit is made contextually recognizable within the material world within which we live. This recognizability is not to be mistaken for the instantiation of the spirit, but the remainder of what is left when the spirit has done its work. It is rather a material referent which points to the Spirit's work within creation. If I can, let me spend a moment on a fine distinction here to say that something is an instantiation of a reality beyond itself is to say that there exists an identity between them and that they are two ways of being that reality. So by saying that the two, are, by saying that the church is an instantiation of the spirit, you're making the, ch uh, the church synonymous with the spirit. And the world is too big for us to believe that the spirit is only interested in the doings of people whose names happen to uh, show up on some parish or some congregational role in terms of membership. Alternatively, to say that something in its material form is evidence of the consequence of the presence of the reality of which it is reference recognizes an essential difference between them such that one is never subsumed into the other, therefore leading to ontological confusion. From my perspective, maintaining this distinction is critical precisely because it is at those moments in which the church mistakes itself for the instantiation of the spirit that it elevates the contingent features of its existence, which are necessarily bound by history and context to the level of the holy, which is by, which is by definition idolatry. So when the church fails to lose sight of itself as conditioned by the space in history, the geography in which it exists, then what it's doing is making the spirit a prisoner of those same features of um, uh, finitude, um, which is by my definition and by the definition of the tradition, idolatry. So then, if we take the church to be a figuration of the spirit, what might we say about that figure? on what is it based? What is its shape and its form? It is just here that I want to make what will be um, uh, uh, or flesh out the claim of this lecture. I want to suggest that the figure of Jesus of the Gospels from which the church draws is that from which the church draws its figuration of the Spirit. Now this claim is not novel. It is what, in, inco in an inchoate way, the What Would Jesus Do movement was trying to get at, what many of the people who are spiritual but not religious are intuiting, um, what the nuns um, have down to a science. The novel claim that I want to propose is that the figure of Jesus is what the figuration of the Spirit is for the church because his life, was a figuration of that self-same spirit and that his life continues to unfold in the world. Now when I use the word his, I'm not using the capital H trying to inject gender into the Trinity. I'm rather very specifically talking about Jesus of the Gospels because I want to anchor 
the idea of figuration in what is given to us in the text and not what's given to us in the ruminations about the text that have become ensconced in our tradi traditions. Consequently, the figuration of the spirit by the church is the ongoing unfolding of Jesus' life, which will not reach its fulfillment until the eschaton. To me, that, that's the sort of logic of the Christian faith, is that Jesus is still alive. And, and his life is still unfolding in this world. And that a church, the church is a part of that unfolding life. This then raises for us the question, in what do we anchor this figuration? So, so what reading of Jesus' life? What signature markings of that life do we uh, place as the figuration? What exactly is the presentation of that life? that is the prime referent in which this figure is grounded. It is well if we notice the need to be attentive to the entire sweep of the phase of the life of Jesus which unfolded in the midst of those witnesses in the biblical text. This requires that we first identify what will be for us the controlling text, what will be our hermeneutical key. through which we narrate this sweep of this life. It is important that we be transparent and honest about this hermeneutical choice for two reasons. First, because it ought to be our goal that there is a parity between our hermeneutical framing point and the substantive point which we want to reach theologically. Second, and perhaps most important, we must resist the impulse to argue as if our point is self-evident because scripture is just so clear. My starting point is Luke, the seventh chapter, the 20th through the 23rd voice, uh, verses, which frames my reading of the sweep of the life of Jesus. So this is my hermeneutical key around which I describe what is going to be the figuration um, that the church should draw from. This text in Luke is, you may recall, when the disciples of John the Baptist come to Jesus and ask, are you the one? His answer is simple. Tell him what you have seen. At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, and those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. My reading of this text, which then shapes my interpretation of the sweep of Jesus' life, is one that exemplifies the spirit ever drawing him to concourse with the despised. I mean, one of the things you see when you look at the text is Jesus rarely went where he wanted to go. Every time he got on his way somewhere, somebody would be pulling on the hem of his garment. Somebody would be sending a messenger telling him to come to my house. He would be trying to get some sleep. And, you know, the disciples uh, uh, were snoring. So he decided to go for a walk across. And, you know, Peter wakes up and just messes that up. So he never he rarely goes anywhere of his own choosing. He's always called to be somewhere, and he's always called to be in the presence of hurting people, in the presence of people who are suffering. Even when he is in the presence of those who have all the material power in the world, their children are still perishing, which is why they call him. Now, each of the people to whom Jesus has been drawn uh, has drawn the attention of John's disciples to would be generally seen as ritually unclean. That is to say, not only would they be shunned by polite society, they would be barred from the sanctuaries of the holy precisely because their condition manifested what many religious folk would call the marks of sin. 
This seems a recurring theme throughout all of the Gospels that Jesus is called into the midst of those deemed unclean by polite society and the religious folk of the day. Folks who by definition stood outside the gate of religious establishments. A point often glossed over is that it is not so much that Jesus goes looking for these people as he is called into their midst and frequently makes reference to the faith which he already finds there. Now it is just here with this notice of the spaces into which Jesus is beckoned that I want to suggest we see the work of the Spirit most powerfully. More, I want to suggest that we begin to see what I have termed the figuration of the Spirit in the materialization of Jesus' work of healing and restoration of those cast away by polite society and the religious. Here I want to be precise with my description of the model I'm inviting you to imagine, the basis for developing a new ecclesiology. There are three moments perichoretically related. First, the Spirit of God hovers over the chaos of hurt, pain, and exclusion that is the lot of the ritually unclean. From this space of being cut off from the sacred spaces, the Spirit beckons to that flesh-bearing materialization of God's felicitous desire for creation, John 3.16, the one whom we call Jesus, who then materializes the power of God's transformation of the material and social world through the restoration of the unclean to their own sense of wholeness and flourishing a restoration which requires neither the assent or validation of polite society or the religious. The story of the lepers in Luke 17 is instructive because it narrates the coming of wholeness, or rather the coming to wholeness, of the unclean as they go into spaces in which they had been anathematized and rejected. Not so that they might receive a blessing, but so that the power of God might be made manifest in them. Leaving then polite society and the religious to respond in wonder and renewal or return to their ways from which God had extended an invitation to experience the power of salvation. Now this triune movement is the economy in which the church as the figuration of the spirit makes sense where Jesus becomes the materialization of God's felicity within creation, a felicity most of whose power is focused on the unclean, he is making spatially visible the power of God. It is this piece that I want to suggest is fertile ground for imagining a figure appropriate for the church. The church in this rendering are those material spaces in which God's felicity is made visible, most notably through the restoration of the unclean to their own agencies of wholeness, becoming demonstrations of God's power over and against the powers of annihilation, which are the powers of this world. It is important to note in the schema that the Spirit is always beckoning the church as it did Jesus, to ever new spaces of materialization, always leaving present moments as historical markers of the constant presence of God with us. So I'm going to turn now to look at the contemporary consequence of this um, proposal. Where then might we intuit the figuration of the spirit to which I have referred throughout this lecture? Where might we find the spirit enlivening the despised and the unclean in ways that they experience and express their salvific agency 
that change the very context of their existence and in so doing invite others into it, into a changed world. Where might we see the beckoning of God now in our context? Well, I am persuaded that the movements for human worth and dignity of the most despised among us, which have been unfolded in the streets across the nation, are precisely that beckoning. The Black Lives Matter movement and other movements of the like have been unfolding a power larger than themselves, which bears witness to the value of the particular lives whose very existence has been rendered in such way as to make them unclean in any material space into which they enter. These movements have in their way doggedly materialized the central conviction at the center of our faith about the worth of persons being an expression of God among us. Like the figuration of the spirit materialized in Jesus, these particular instances of the church becoming have been in nondescript spaces of little consequence to any save those sentenced to cohabitation with legion. The challenge for us is to recognize uh, the contemporary figurations of the spirit as being just that, a figuration of the church which is becoming and which is God's beckoning to us. In this we find ourselves much like Nicodemus being called by God into a new reality of which we have limited sense-making tools and which may well mean our demise. Yet knowing that a force is drawing us into the unknown future Scripture does not record Nicodemus' response to Jesus' entreaty that he be born again. Neither, I think, will history record our response. But, as with Nicodemus, the Spirit will continue on with God's work however we respond. Of that we can be assured. Thank you.